Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Sewa Omuwale, and I'm the program manager for African American Studies. Thank you for coming today. I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today. Dr. Ibram X. Kenty is an assistant professor of African American history at the University of Florida. An intellectual and social movement historian, Dr. Kenty studies races and anti-racist ideas and movements. He is the author of the award-winning book, The Black Campus Movement, Black Students and the Radical Reconstruction of Higher Education, 1965 to 1972 the first national study of black student activism during that period. Dr. Kenty has also published 14 essays on the black campus movement, black power, and intellectual history in books and referred academic journals. Dr. Kenty has received research fellowships, grants, and visiting appointments from a variety of universities, foundations, professional associations, and libraries. He is a regular public speaker and contributor to contributor of commentaries. He is currently working on the first general history of New York Black Power, Black Apple, Malcolm X, and Black Power in New York, 1954 to 1974, a book under con contract with New York Press. Today he is here to speak about his second book, Stamped from the Beginning, The Definitive, the Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, which was long listed for the National Book Award. Please join me and welcome Dr. Kenty. So I'm not going to speak long. I, of course, first of all, I would like to thank Sir Wa for that introduction. Thank you, Professor Conyers, for uh, giving me this opportunity to, to come and speak to you all. Uh, it's truly an honor. Uh, of course, I have to thank my cousins who, who drove into town from, from the Dallas area, if you can just sort of wave, um, for being here. I'm a little sort of nervous because now my whole family's gonna know what, what went on during this, uh, but uh, please bear with me. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank uh, all of you uh, for being here. Uh, for those of you, for those of you who are black and Latino, who, who live in, in black and Latino neighborhoods, thank you for venturing out of your hell uh, to come here. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Um, <laughs> you know, I know, uh, I don't really know how you really made it here alive, but, you know, I'm <laughs> thankful uh, that you're here. Uh, of course, if I come to Texas, I have to say her name. Uh, and so peace to Sandra Blind, peace to Keith Scott, peace to someone who, whose name we, we began, who, whose name we learned around the time in which I began writing this book, Trayvon Martin. And peace to so many names we can't stop saying. I dedicated this book, stamped from the beginning, to the lives they said don't matter. And they in the lives that said, th they into the lives that said don't matter are racist ideas. And, and so stamped, is a narrative history of racist ideas from their origins to the present. So it's the first comprehensive history of racist ideas. And it's organized into five sections. And each of these sections are the narrative sort of flows through the life of a major character. The first section, which primarily covers early America, the major character is Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather was a Boston theologian uh, and he probably was the most prolific and foremost early American um, intellectual and scholar. To be a scholar in early America was to be, an in, was to be a theologian, and <laughs> to be a theologian was to be a scholar because science and theology were sort of interspersed. And just to give you a sense of Cotton Mather, Cotton Mather disagreed with many slave owners who believed that black people could not become Christian because they were so barbaric uh, and because their souls were permanently black and evil. Cotton Mather, on the other hand, believed that all souls could become white. And so therefore, black people could become Christian. Just give you a little sense of Cotton Mather. The next character was Thomas Jefferson for the second section. And his sort of period runs through the early parts of Revolutionary War up until 
the start of the abolitionist movement in the 1820s. And I don't think I have to explain anything about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, the third character was William Lloyd Garrison, who was the foremost white male abolitionist. And William Lloyd Garrison was somebody who believed that black people had literally been made into brutes by slavery. Um, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about that theory uh, in a little bit. And the next major character was W.E.B. Du Bois for the first fourth section. And his section runs from the fall of Reconstruction up until the Civil Rights era. As many of you may not know, W.E.B. Du Bois died on the eve of the March on Washington. Uh, and then the final character for the final section is Angela Davis. So just to give you a sense, sort of sense of the scope uh, of the book. And of course, I tried to make this book as readable as possible uh, for as many people as possible. Uh, because one of the things that's happened is, especially over the last 20 years, as more and more scholars have been studying race, the discussion on race has bec within the scholarly community has become that much more complex. And we haven't necessarily been able to transmit many of those complexities about race, or I should say racism, uh, to the masses, to the public. And that's one of the things that I hoped that this book was able to achieve. Uh, of course, it's very difficult, <laughs> right, to try to simplify these extremely complex ideas that scholars have been um, figuring out. But that's one of the things that I hoped to do. So in order to write a history book on racist ideas, what's the first thing you have to do? Define a <laughs> racist idea, which was probably one of the more difficult projects that I had to do over the course of, of, of writing this, this book. Why? Because <laughs> what a racist idea, where I, where I draw that line, is deeply political. And every group of people that I chronicle in this book define themselves out of racism, every single one. So just like now, we uh, have people who are trying to defend the racism of Donald Trump and saying that he's not a racist, so too were people saying that slave owners were not prejudiced. Right? There's a long history to people who truly are uh, articulating racist ideas simultaneously classifying themselves as not racist by the way they're defining what a racist idea is. And so that was a deeply difficult and politicized and controversial project. Uh, and I realized First and foremost, that the group that articulated, that first used the term racism and defined racism, defined it in a way that left their own racist ideas out. Now, who am I referring to? Well, a group who believed that the races are biologically equal, but simultaneously believed that black people were in every other way inferior, culturally inferior, behaviorally inferior. Those people defined a racist idea as simply notions of natural, inherent, biological inferiority. And those who believed that, specifically those who were part of what was known as the eugenics movement. So the eugenics scholars were the racist ones, and the rest of us who were talking about African American culture as being inferior, Africa as being barbaric. No, those aren't racist ideas. You see the sort of way that worked. Ruth Benedict, in particular, who was a Columbia University anthropologist, wrote a book called Race, Science, and Society in 1939, in which she first defined the term racism. And she defined it in a way as only reducing it to notions of biological and permanent inferiority. And, and so in defining it, I recognized that actually there weren't there was not this sort of long history between this sort of two-way debate between racist and anti-racist. I began to see that there were actually two groups of racist, or I should more specifically say two kinds of racist ideas. And so there's the, tr I can call it traditional kind, the notion that the racial groups are biologically distinct and black people are biologically inferior and then the other group states that the racial groups are biologically equal, but black people are in some ways behaviorally inferior. Um, and so 
stepping back a little bit, I ended up defining a racist idea as any idea that suggests a racial group is inferior or superior to another racial group in any way. Now, racial group is a, the, the term racial group, uh, the reason why I use that term is because that definition was largely based on intersectional theory. So what do I mean? So racial group, black people, just like other racial gr groups in a general sense, are a collection of groups. And so when you think about black women, for instance, that is a racial slash gender group. That's a racial group, and it's also a gender group. And it's the intersection of race and gender simultaneously, right? And so we can understand black women as a racial group. We can understand the black poor as a racial group. We can understand black lesbians as a racial group, right? And so it wasn't, I didn't just chronicle the history of racist ideas about black people in general. I chronicled the history of racist ideas about black women, about the black poor, right, about black men, about every single racial group that makes up black people, even black politicians, <laughs> right, even black spaces like black churches or black businesses, right, these ideas extend into all of these different places. Uh, and so I, the two kinds of racist ideas that I ended up sort of defining was one, again, the notion of biological inferiority. And I identified or I named that type of racist idea as a segregationist idea, as a segregationist idea. And then the other group that stated that the racial groups are biologically equal, but black people were in some ways behaviorally inferior, I named that type of racist idea as an assimilationist idea. And then there was a third group that, or I should say a third group of ideas that constantly sort of flows in the narrative, and that is an anti-racist idea, which in, a simp in its most simplest sense, those, the idea that black people or racial groups are not only biologically equal, but also behaviorally equal, right? So you see the sort of way that works. Um, and so those three ideas, those three positions, those three groups constant, were constantly debating over the course of American history uh, in Stamped as, as they have across time. And so to, to sort of put this into a, a, a frame we can understand, the current national debate over race and policing Really, there's three major positions on the issue. So you have one group, which I would identify as segregationists, who principally blame black people for the reason why young black men, for instance, are 21 times more likely to be shot by the, killed by the police than young white men. There's something wrong principally with black people. The other group, another group states that no, there's something wrong with the police, <laughs> right? And that position is an anti-racist position. And then you have a group sort of in the middle, <laughs> right? Again, going back to the definition of assimilationist ideas, they both speak about notions of equality and hierarchy. So that middle position states that they're both to blame. Black, young black men or young black people in general are acting more recklessly with the police than white people are, and the police are acting racist in a racist fashion with black people. They say both, and so therefore we need programs that address supposedly both problems and both issues. And so if you really sort of begin to sort of look out at the debate, you see those three positions operating. And in writing this history, I had to sort of distinguish between what I call the producers of racist ideas and the consumers of racist ideas. And so the book primarily chronicled the producers of racist ideas, the people who are producing the idea that currently there's a war against cops. And that is the principal problem that and therefore, another major problem is black-on-black -black crime. 
And the reason why there's so much black on black crime is because the black family is in tatters. And the reason why the black family is in tatters is because, you know, black people can't get along <laughs> or black men uh, don't want to act right or black women don't want to act right. And so all of these ideas connoting that basically the black family is inferior to the white family. Black women and men are inferior to white men <laughs> and white women, right? That there's a such thing as greater black crime than there is, there's more black crime than there is white crime, right? All of these ideas, people who are producing these ideas, right? And then there's the rest of us who are what? Consuming the ideas. And so I, the book chronicles those major producers of ideas. And then I specifically wanted to, to figure out why were they producing these ideas? Why is Rudy Giuliani going around talking about that there is a war on cops? What does Rudy Giuliani have to gain from that? Or what does Rudy Giuliani have to lose from there actually being a national conversation about a war on black lives? Like, what do these people have to gain from producing those ideas at that time? Or, th or is it simply that's what they believe and they're just stating what they believe? Uh, and I began to realize that our common conception that people like a Rudy Giuliani or even a Trump um, or even a Hillary Clinton when she stated that young blacks were super predators, that these people are simply ignorant and hateful. Um, and that is why they are stating these racist ideas, that that perspective, that common perspective is actually not true. It is actually ahistorical. And, and when you actually study the motives behind why these people were producing these racist ideas at that time, you begin to realize that what's actually behind these ideas is not ignorance and hate, but racist policies and the need to defend existing racist policies, the need to normalize or rationalize existing racial inequities. So ultimately, I, I found that it wasn't this notion that ignorance and hate was leading to racist ideas. And then these people with these racist ideas were instituting racist policies like slavery or, or segregation or mass incarceration. I actually found it was the opposite. And so typically, people were instituting racist policies typically out of self-interest, whether economic, political, or cultural. And then they produced, or their defenders produced, racist ideas to justify, to rationalize those existing policies. And then the mass circulation of those racist ideas led to our what? Ignorance and hate. And so that's what I found. I chronicled that over and over again. Uh, throughout the course of American history. And so that then, that then shows that the function of, the, that racist ideas have long had a function, a function for power. And that function has been to normalize racial inequities. To give it, it's a very, it's a very simple thing, right? If you believe, if you have consumed the racist idea that black people are dangerous criminals, who are reckless with the police. When you hear these statistics, like 21 times more likely, or you even hear about young black people being shot or even older by the police, it's going to make sense to you. There's not going to be a problem because you have, you have consumed the idea that these people are reckless with the police. If you believe the idea that black workers are lazy, or they're lazier than white workers, then when you find out that over the last 50 years, the black unemployment rate has been twice as high as the white unemployment rate, it's going to seem normal to you, right? I mean, it's <laughs> that's not going to seem like a problem, right? I mean, and so when the, the function, the way that, if you believe that black people were cursed forever for slavery, or that Africa had specifically nurtured them for barbarism and that when they came to America, even though they were enslaved, they were being civilized, 
slavery is going to seem like a good thing, right, if you believe these ideas. And so that's been sort of the function uh, of these ideas. And typically powerful people have recognized this function and utilized and deployed racist ideas uh, based on that function. Uh, because typically these policies that were in place were benefiting them. And so they didn't want resistance against these policies. And the way you prevent people from resisting is you feed them with racist ideas that make it seem as if these inequities should be the case. And we understand that from slavery, right? We understand how a slave owner is going to project that black people should be enslaved for their own economic benefit, right? That's a very simple thing for people to understand. But somehow we think that that project sort of ended with slavery. No, it continued on, and it continues on uh, to this day. And so what does that mean then? If, if racist ideas are not coming out of ignorance and hate, if racist ideas are coming out of racist policies, then that means the strategies that racial reformers have used to basically end the life of racist ideas, those strategies have failed for a reason. If, you, if racist ideas are not coming out of ignorance and hate, then educating <laughs> right, and trying to circulate love is not going to solve that problem. You see the way that works? If I, as a powerful producer, am producing these ideas, not because I'm ignorant or hateful, but because I have an economic or political benefit, then you trying to educate me about how racist my ideas are is not going to stop me from producing them. It's just like, you know, you have many companies um, and you have executives who, of those companies, who sell harmful products. And those executives know those products are harmful. So us trying to go to the executive and say, you know what, your product is so harmful, you need to stop producing that product. As if they're going to stop. Well, first of all, as if they didn't already know. And as if they're going to stop because you said that to them. You know, you begin to see why this, you know, we've long been taught, OK, education is the way, right? why that has failed. That, that strategy has been used ever since the abolitionist movement. You're talking about 200 plus years we've been trying to educate away racist ideas. We've been trying to persuade away racist ideas. And they continue to be produced and reproduced over and over again, despite this mass education. And I was able to sort of make the case as to why. And that is because, again, they came out of these racist uh, policies. Another quick thing along those lines, for black people in particular, um, black people have been taught ever since the abolitionist movement. And w during the 1790s in particular, as a result of a lot of black people ran away uh, during the Revolutionary War, and there were some uh, slave owners who decided to free uh, some of their captives. And so you had this massive increase in the number of free black people after uh, the American Revolution. And so by the 1790s, you had a noticeable sort of free black communities forming uh, throughout parts of the Upper South and even the North. And so what abolitionists did was they said to these people, you know what, your behavior is going to determine the life of racist ideas. If you act in a positive, non-stereotypical way, then you will persuade away the racist ideas of white people. But if you act criminal-like, lazy, drinking, all of these negative things, then that's going to reinforce the racist ideas of white people. And if you reinforce the racist ideas of white people, then that will continue the enslavement of black people. See the way that sort of, so that was this sort of lesson. And I termed it in the book, Uplift Suasion. And I chronicled sort of the history of this strategy that has long been taught 
uh, by white liberals to black people and even by black elites to the black poor and even to themselves. Uh, that is that it's the responsibility of every individual black person by their own behavior in white spaces to persuade away the racist ideas of white people. And every time a black individual acts in a stereotypical manner, they're bringing the race down and they're reinforcing racist ideas. Uh, this quite possibly may be the most popular strategy <laughs> uh, that people use, I, I should say black people use. Uh, this is, in, in a scholarly sense, it's called the politics of respectability. Um, and so one of the things that I found about this strategy is first and foremost, of course, it's failed. Um, and the reason why it's failed is because even at its origins in the 1790s, those black people who were defying stereotypes, those Barack Obamas in 1790s were classified by racist whites as extraordinary Negroes. There was actually a famous book <laughs> uh, written on one of these black people that was titled The Extraordinary Negro. So what does that mean? That means that that Negro is not like those ordinarily inferior black people. That's what that means. So even when, <laughs> even when you do all of these things, you'll just get classed aside as not really black, not really inferior. And so because of the whole notion of the extraordinary Negro, that's one of the reasons why uplift suasion has failed. But then also uplift suasion is based on a racist idea. It's based on the idea that there is some truth to racist notions that black people are inferior. That black people behave that truth. And if they were only to behave that truth, not at all or less, right, that those racist ideas that white people have would go away, right? And so this strategy that people have long used again, is based on a racist idea. And it's bound to fail because of that conception of an extraordinary Negro. But people have continued uh, to use it. And so if uplift suasion has failed, and it's a racist strategy, uh, if persuasion more broadly has not brought about the end of racist ideas, if education won't do it, what could do it. And again, going back to if racist policies are leading to racist ideas, then in order to undermine racist ideas, what do you have to focus on undermining? The policies. In, in a more simple sense, racist ideas are almost like the PR arm of the company of racist policies. That's pretty much their function. It's almost like the PR machine. So you get rid of the company, what happens to the PR machine? And so how do you get rid of, of course, racist policies, right? Clearly that's not, that's not a struggle of education, right? That's a struggle of power, right? That's a struggle for social movements. Uh, and so one of, the things, one of the things that I sort of hope that came out of this book is that even if you are attempting to undermine racist ideas, you still have to engage in power struggles, right, that are irrespective of racist ideas um, in order to do so. And another thing that I sort of want to add before I sit down is that when I, when I defined racist ideas, and even when I studied the history of uplift suasion, I had to sort of recognize and come to grips with the fact that over the course of my lifetime, I had consumed racist ideas about black people. And so the idea, for instance, that there's something wrong with the black poor or there's something wrong with black women, 
or there's something wrong with uh, another black group, those ideas have not just been produced or consumed by white people. Those ideas have been <laughs> produced and consumed by black people too. Right? I mean, and, and so I had to come to grips with my own ideas, right, in order to really write this book. Um, and that's not to say that black people are just as responsible. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to get into that sort of discussion. That is to say that there are black people who do not resist racist policies because they have consumed racist ideas. And so one of the things we should understand is, you know, we've primarily talked about racist ideas historically as ideas that have been consumed by white people. And they certainly have. But the producers of these ideas, I could make the case, targeted black people as much, if not more, than white people. Why? Again, let's take it back to the simplicity of, I shouldn't say simplicity, but uh, let's take it back to slavery. If you have convinced your enslaved African that they should be enslaved because they're black, will they run away? Will they resist you? Will they join a slave revolt? No. Right? And so the resistance of black people historically to racial discrimination and racist policies and white supremacy has long been tied to their own racist ideas. Meaning, if they have more racist ideas, they're less likely to resist. If they have less racist ideas, they're more likely to resist. And those in power have recognized that. And so that's why they've constantly challenged um, the racist ideas of black people. And in our time, of course, we're living in a moment of the Black Lives Matter movement. And many, one, of, one of the things that people don't know about the origins of that movement is that Alicia Garza, who first coined that sort of term, uh, did so on her Facebook, and it was primarily directed towards black people, who, after the Zimmerman verdict, were blaming black people for their condition. Right? And so her love letter, that Black Lives Matter, was a primarily a love letter for black people. Of course, it became a love letter for all people who don't think that black lives matter. But just to show you the power that these racist ideas have even had on black people. And, and so what that, so then I've been able to study nearly 600 years of racist ideas. And all different types of ways in which people have tried to make the case that black groups are in some way inferior. Um, that there's something wrong with black groups. And I've only been able to figure out and I've only been able to substantiate one idea that is actually wrong with black people. And that is that the only thing that's wrong with black people is that we think something is wrong with black people. That's it. That's the only thing I can verify. And you take something like black neighborhoods are more dangerous, which is probably the most popular idea shared across races. Um, and I'm going to close sort of talking about this idea. This idea, of course, primarily is based on crime data, right? Crime statistics based on arrest and incarceration rates, not actual crime rates, right? So th that's the first thing. So we know, for instance, <laughs> that there are kids on this campus who sell and consume drugs who happen to be white just as much, if not more, some studies show, than some of the kids who get arrested pretty regularly in the black neighborhood down the street, right? And so most people who are in prison are in prison for drug offenses. And the vast majority of those people are black, despite the data that shows actual crime rates that black people and white people and other racial groups sell and consume at similar rates. But black people are sometimes 10 times more likely to be arrested and incarcerated. Right? So that's one side. The other side, of course, is more specific to violent crime. Um, and one of the things that I want you to think about as it relates to violent crime 
is we, of course, have a pretty regular discussion about homicides. Um, of course, they even talked about that last night during the debate. And the number of homicides there are in black neighborhoods. And it is the case that, especially for young black men, that homicides is their number one killer. And that there's a homicide issue or problem. Because uh, even if there's one homicide in any community, uh, that's a problem. But one type of violent crime that white men predominate in is almost never included in the discussion of violent crime. Does anybody want to take a guess what I'm talking about? Yes. Rape? No, actually, drunk driving. Drunk driving. So you look it up. You see how many people die every year from, or get injured every year from drunk drivers versus from homicide. And it's not even close in most years in terms of the number of people who die every year from drunk driving compared to homicides. And, and one study found that 75% of drunk drivers are white men. Right? But when we look at the response to drunk drivers, which is actually a very good one, meaning they have, you know, the first offense, right? You do this, and then it gets sort of harsher. That's actually not bad. But when we look at the response of people to homicides or even other, even drug offenses, I mean, it's this huge sort of disparity, right? And so what I'm ultimately trying to say is that when we understand the racial groups, I'm not trying to make the case that the racial groups are the same. That the same thing that happens in black communities is the same thing, and that that should be the goal. What I'm saying is that they're equal, meaning there's a violent crime problem in white neighborhoods too, and it's called drunk driving. And some people would argue that for many of the people who are, say many, though certainly not all, of the people who are victims of violent crime in black neighborhoods, specifically homicides, are people who are engaged in some way in, for instance, drugs, to give an example, or gangs. While the whites who are usually victims of drunk drivers are completely innocent. And so what that then means is, as it relates to safety, because there's always this discussion about black neighborhoods being more dangerous, right? If you are an American, who doesn't sell or consume drugs or is not affiliated in a gang, which neighborhood would you be safer in? And I, I, sur I surmise that that's actually an open question if we were to introduce drunk driving into the equation. Now, of course, if you're engaged in, in gang activity or something else, that's a different discussion, right? But when you actually look at the data of the number of people who get injured and killed every year, as a result of drunk driving, it really truly becomes an open question. And so what that then means ultimately is that, you know, I believe uh, philosophically that the racial groups are equal. And that doesn't mean that there aren't dangerous black people or <laughs> uh, lazy black people. It means that there's no group that has a monopoly on any of these sort of negative traits. And nobody has able, been ever able to, to truly definitively show that. They've created and utilized and manipulated a series of statistics and, um, and frames uh, and theories, but no one has been able to statistically show that. And so what that then means is when I see racial disparities and inequities, I see racist policies. And it therefore becomes my job as an intellectual to discover, to interrogate, to figure out what those policies are. I'll end there. Thank you.
arranged for those of you who want to buy his book so that he can sign it for you. Um, so again, I apologize for that. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kenty. Um, it will take about two questions and then we'll end. Anybody have a question? That's a lot of good information, right? You don't need any questions. <laughs> No questions, no questions or comments? Yes. Sure. Just in the, in the past week on the radio, you know, with all the political stuff going on, someone made a comment. I don't know the race of the person who said it, but um, that person felt that the, the increase in um, uh, crime in the black community and the, uh, the police encounters and things like that had increased since Barack Obama had president and was suggesting that having a black president, having Obama in that position, increased this racial divide. Um, I have my own kind of ideas about why that's ridiculous, but <laughs> um, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. So uh, I'm happy you bring that up. And I, I want to state something that I meant to say in the discussion of, quote, dangerous black neighborhoods. Uh, they'll speak to this somewhat. And that is that uh, some studies show that there's a direct correlation between unemployment rates and, and violent crime. Uh, and so, w meaning even controlling for racial groups. So no matter the racial groups, you have a high concentration of unemployment, you have a high concentration of violent crime. And so what that then means to me is that there's no such thing as a dangerous black neighborhood. Now there may be a such thing as a dangerous unemployed neighborhood, right? But then that would create a, a political situation in which politicians would have to talk about using jobs to fight crime, which of course uh, seems to be too radical for this country. Uh, to your question specifically, um, I have no idea. I mean, it seems to me, uh, based on a lot of anecdotal um, evidence, um, and even the rise of somebody like a Sarah Palin, um, and then ultimately a Trump, uh, that um, the white backlash, or I should say the racist backlash, because even there's been a lot of backlash to Obama from uh, racist blacks, is that that could be a cause of it. Um, but it's hard to sort of say definitively. But I think that, I think historians are probably going to write it that way um, because there's, there's overwhelming evidence, anecdotal evidence, um, to suggest that. Uh, but it, of course, we, we can't really say definitively, if that makes sense. Yes? So I would say, um, pretty simply, no. I don't think that uh, the most powerful uh, Americans, specifically those who recognize the way in which uh, race and racism allows them to not only manipulate black people um, and control um, and devastate black people, but really all groups. I mean, you know, the ways in which white voters have been manipulated by racist ideas, um, I mean, it's pretty obvious right over the last 30 years with just use words like affirmative action, tough on crime and welfare. Suddenly, <laughs> you know, people are therefore um, sort of mobilized, some people, to uh, vote against their economic interests, to give an example. What Du Bois way back called the wage of whiteness. Uh, and so, you know, without that wage of whiteness, it would be difficult to control white people. Uh, and of course, without um, racism, it would be that much more difficult to control black people. And, you know, these groups and even other uh, uh, racial groups, and these groups need to be controlled in order for people to maintain power, in order for people to continue to, continue to extract so much money um, for the 
1%, um, and they recognize its utility, and they've always recognized it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I even began to sort of question whether some of these producers of racist ideas even believe the ideas that they're saying. I know how they, they recognize its power, but oftentimes they were, they were so ridiculous, or they were so ridiculous coming from somebody who I knew was so brilliant. And when I say brilliant, <laughs> I know you're like, how can a person who articulating racist ideas be brilliant? But they're using their intelligence to what? Produce and figure out these mass manipulators, right? That's how they utilize their intelligence. Uh, and so it, it's really, I don't even know. Because I, I think some of these people may not even believe the things that come out of them. I, we may even be seeing that right now in this campaign. Um, I want to say I really enjoyed uh, some of the things in which you said. Um, really, you know, obviously some of these things um, I, I've known about, but the way in which you sort of frame them uh, is very enlightening. Uh, I want to ask you, are you suggesting when you talk about policies, um, the policies sit as really the foundation of sort of uh, race, racial, racially oppressive ideology? Um, and if so, I, I remember Hillary Clinton saying to Black Lives Matter uh, representatives, that you're, she's asking, what do you want? And they were claiming to her that they want you know, racism to change and to, to be you know, depleted. She said, I can't change people's hearts. I change policy. Mm -hmm. And so should policy changing or, or the reform of, of certain policies or, or policy building in general, should that be the primary sort of tactic right now if we're trying to improve um, the black experience in America based on sort of what you were saying? In your book? So to preface what I'm going to say, um, with a counter with Hillary. Um, and Black Lives Matter, uh, or I should say the Movement for Black Lives, put out a pretty detailed policy statement on August 1st, stating all of the different things that they feel uh, should be paid, changed from a policy standpoint. This is one year after Hillary Clinton made that statement about, you know what, you need to bring me some policy initiatives. What has been the response of Hillary Clinton? Crickets, right? Nothing. Uh, and so, um, so I say that to say that I would say yes to your question, right? But that doesn't mean that I'm necessarily agreeing with what Hillary said at that point, because she was stating that because she did not think, or let me not speculate why, but Ultimately, she didn't even believe that herself, right? Because otherwise, she would have responded to the Black Lives, to the platform. Um, but I do think, I do not think, I think there's been all of these efforts to change hearts. Um, and those efforts have more or less failed. And one of the things that I've had to do with writing this book is I had to, re in some ways, rewrite the racial history of the United States. Because we've been taught this history in which um, there's been steady racial progress as a result of persuasion. So abolitionists persuaded away people, and that's why slavery ended. Civil rights activists persuaded away uh, Americans, and that's why segregation ended. But if you actually look at the historical events, it had nothing to do with persuasion that caused these powerful people to make those changes. Right? And so it was force. It was power. It was a social movement um, that typically led to, and when I say policy, policy comes out of social movements, right? And so, you know, you initiate a social movement, you initiate a revolution, right? And then you're going to initiate that based on the notion that you want to recreate society. And so then when you recreate society, how do you recreate society? With new policies, right? At its, in its most simplest sense, if that makes sense. Oh, it's okay. Um, the books are at the bookstore. Um, I think it's